Hi, all. Very happy to be here. Um, I do want to say um, the meeting the president story uh, is true. It's actually not one that I tend to talk about very much because similar to all the people in this room, uh, it is the people who have been doing the work day in and day out over two years and four years and eight years and 30 years at the Department of Education and at other agencies. This is going to be a thing, isn't it? Um, that are doing the hard work and that have been doing it and don't get to meet the president and have him come and work. And they're just doing the work without getting necessarily like the accolades and the articles in Fast Company. And so um, while I appreciate it and it was an incredible experience and I'm so happy that I ended up there, uh, I don't tend to tell it just because I'm not the one who actually deserves kind of the credit and the visibility into it. So I just want to say that. Oh, look, my picture. Um, so, ah, okay, I understand how this is working. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, I want to actually talk to you guys about, I know a little bit about what the program is that you guys are going to be doing over the next couple of days. And I wanted to actually talk a little bit about what we call uh, user-centered design or human-centered design uh, and open data. And I wanted to use a project that I worked on called College Scorecard to really um, showcase and use it as a case study about what works and what can be successful. The thing that's important to me is that you don't have to be a technologist to make these tools work for you. We talk about user-centered design and development, but in my case, we now talk about user-centered policy and user-centered government. And that same thing can be applied as we talk about the projects and the ways that you guys are thinking about innovating and creating new things. So that was what I wanted to try to talk uh, today about. Um, so my name is Lisa Galopter. Um, Eric gave you guys a little bit of my background. Um, I am with what we call the U.S. Digital Service. So the U.S. Digital Service was founded in August of 2014. It's new under the president, and it is a group of uh, primarily uh, technologists who come from the private sector. It was founded on the model of the rescue of healthcare.gov, where a small group of folks kind of parachuted in to work with the agencies to see what actually could be done in a short amount of time. Uh, and so that was the idea was to how we could actually use that model across the board at other agencies. Uh, our mission and our mandate is to use digital technologies to improve the way government serves the American people. And not necessarily at just an abstract level, but actually at an individual level. Most of the projects we do are citizen facing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, so we actually select projects by things that are going to have the biggest impact on the largest number of people. So we started out where people were literally dying for want of services. So we started out at healthcare, at the Veterans Administration, and it's not a far leap to know why we are at immigration as well as education where I'm the lead. So my background, he spoke about it a little bit. Um, the thing that's been interesting to me about this is that I've been working in technology for almost 30 years at the cross of kind of media and technology and where those two live. I've worked on some stuff that um, most of you have installed on your computers. Um, my products have at this point actually shipped to probably over billions of people. Um, and I'm, yet I'm here to say that what I'm doing now, I've never done something so important in my life. And I'm just gr thrilled to be here. I am not civically oriented. I haven't been traditionally. I'm, I'm shocked that I'm standing up here to talk about what government can do, because that is not what my experience has been. Um, so it's been, a, it's been an incredible journey um, to get here. In particular, um, I'm grateful to be at the U.S. Department of Education. My experience is a little bit different. It did take me 24 years to graduate from college. I will also say that I am a black woman with a degree in computer science, which apparently makes me a unicorn. <laughs> um, but being able to, right, I worked 40 hours a week to put myself through school. I am a Pell Grant recipient. It just, it, it was a hard, hard journey. Um, but the fact that I was able to get there, and if I could actually help open the doors to higher education to even one more person, I would be grateful for being able to do this job. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but so I'm very grateful to, uh, to be here. Have many of you have heard of College Scorecard? Any of you? Okay, good. Um, this was a project that the president um, wanted to make happen. I'm just looking at the time to make sure that I go fast enough. Uh, but the idea is, um, at, in this day and age, a college education is the surest path to the middle class, right? Um, if you are, um, it, there's studies that say uh, that if you have a degree from a four-year institu institution, that it is worth a million more dollars over the course of your lifetime. Um, and yet, uh, people are going to schools that are not service, service, serving their students well, and so we want to provide a way for them to 
um, understand what value a school could actually give them, specifically targeting folks who are most vulnerable. So uh, first, first generation college goers, low income students, children of undocumented workers, and trying to figure out how we could actually get data out there that would help them make an informed choice. So that was the premise. Um, so the question became, how do we actually, uh, how do we systemically change the conversation? How do we actually start getting people to look at this new kind of metric and these new things that actually make a school valuable, as opposed to being measured on the number of dollars your alumni donates, right? Or, or letting less people into school. How do we actually get students to think about how much you'll earn after you graduate, or how much it actually costs depending on your income bracket, those kinds of things. Um, so we built this project based on human-centered design. Every single thing that we did was about that. Uh, and the things that are important there is to really put yourself into the shoes of your audience and to understand what their needs and their perspectives are. What you want to build is something that will actually, it's not about outputs, it's about outcomes. You want to have a measurable change in behavior. It's not just building something, it's actually figuring out what you want them to do, what the end result needs to be. Uh, and so focusing on that and really actually listening to the user and building everything that you do around that. We have a thing we call build, measure, learn, and so it's really about small increments and trying to understand, again, talking to the user and getting out there and, um, and understanding what we call empathizing with them. So actually sitting there and saying, well, how do you do this and why do you do this and trying to understand it. Um, this actually also helps to reduce waste. So you don't build things that people aren't going to use and people don't want. So it's a critical thing. In this particular case, college scorecard, the president had ideas about what they wanted to be, the Department of Education, all kinds of different folks, thoughts, folks had thoughts. Um, and we went out and we talked to, you know, students. Uh, and I had been in uh, DC for a whole four days, and I had not spoken to a student yet, and yet I was assigned to get this project done in three months. Uh, and I was started breaking out in hives, because I was like, I don't know any students in DC, I don't know any, any, any parents who have college-age students in DC, like how am I going to find students? And some member of my team basically said, so we can go out to the mall. And I was like, oh, where the youth hangs out, the stores, oh, of course. And she was like, or the Washington Mall, right outside the building? Uh, and it was actually a genius idea. We went out and we accosted students as they were coming out of uh, the Air and Space Museum for three hours. Uh, it was spring break, and we talked, we talked to people from like Wyoming, from Minnesota, from Nebraska. We just got a really uh, wide swath of people, but it was a really genius idea. So that's one of the things that I would actually encourage, is get out of the building. Make sure you are talking to whoever your audience is as you're trying to actually build stuff for students. Um, so that's critical. Um, this is one of the quotes. Well, so things that we learned from it, this is actually my favorite quote. Uh, I don't, can you guys see it over there? Perfect. Uh, and it's just, the thing that was interesting about it is just in terms of listening to them, you actually saw that they know how to do um, comparison shopping. That is a behavior they're used to. They just weren't applying it to their college decision making. And so it just is, and so I am from New York City, so I don't know from uh, rabbit harnesses. Um, but it really was, it was just fascinating to understand people with different perspectives and kind of how they take their approach and how they think about things. And then understanding, again, empathizing, how we can pull that in and apply it to the thing we actually want them to do. Um, so we came up with this problem statement, which is we want to engage and educate potential college students of any age or background and those that support and advise them to find the schools best suited to them. Now you will notice with this problem statement, it doesn't say, build a website, it doesn't say build an API, it really is about the fundamental crux of the issue of the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think, and every time we actually had a conversation about what it was we were building, we always started with what is the goal, what is the problem statement, what is the problem you're trying to solve. So what did we end up with based on that? Uh, we actually did in fact build a consumer tool. We built it based on the user feedback that we heard. We based it on what we heard students and parents wanted to search for. Uh, we made it mobile friendly because most of the people were actually doing their searches on their phones. Uh, and again, it's, it is exactly what we wanted it to be, right? It actually shows kind of what we call the value metrics. So um, looking at the graduation rates, the average annual cost, not, not, not the sticker price, but how much per, the real person, the average person who actually goes there really does pay. Um, and then there's some more detail, uh, graduation rates, retention rates, uh, salary after attending, also repayment rates, which turns out to be really, really important as you were looking about. You, know, you need to know that you'll be able to go there, get a job, and be able to pay off however many loans that you're going to be able to take out. So, 
That was really great, very important, glad we did it. I would argue that the most important thing we did was actually open up the data. So um, this, was the, this was the most massive data release that the Department of Education had ever done. It was 7,300 schools, 1,900 columns of data per year per school, and then 18 years worth of that. And what we wanted to do was systemically change the conversation. So it wasn't actually just about students and parents and guidance counselors. It was also about researchers and policymakers and media and people who actually can influence how, 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 how people are making those decisions uh, systemically. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we actually addressed those as well. So this is a teeny, 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 teeny snapshot of the data. Uh, it's it is what it is. It looks like this. Um, what we did was we actually created a data section that, uh, that laid it out much more prettily. It had some explanations, some quotes about here are the important things to look at. It had a technical paper, a policy paper, all things that are really important. But again, what I would say is what we did was actually we created something called an application programming interface, an API. And the most important reason why we did that is what we like to say in media is you want to get your content out to your users wherever they might be looking for it, on whatever device they might be looking for it, at whatever time they might be looking for it. And so actually making people, forcing people to come to an ed.gov website kind of defeats the purpose. We wanted to make sure that we could actually get it out into the wild world uh, and people would start using it. So in order to do that, we actually partnered with uh, a number of third party organizations. So while the Department of Education cannot say this is a good school and this is a bad school. Partially because how do you compare a Howard University, a historically black college and university, to a, ha to a Harvard? They serve different audiences and so their data is going to look different. How do you compare a Berkeley School of Music or a Divinity School to an MIT? It's not that one is better than the other. The question is you just need to have the data and the information so you can make the best choice for you. Now, that's the Department of Education. A lot of these third party organizations actually do work within the communities that they are trying to serve. And so they can say, I know you, poor student who gets free lunch, who's you know, black, whatever it is, can act like these are schools that will work best for you and serve this kind of population well. Uh, and so that was one of the things that we wanted to do. We really wanted to, to amplify the reach of the data. So I'm just going to give you a couple of quick examples. Um, this is actually an organization that serves, it works with low-income students in the Bay Area. Um, and this is one of the things that I just, I, I love this example because it's so um, compelling, right? You look at this and on its surface, uh, San Francisco State University and San Jose State University, which are 45 minutes apart, on the surface the data looks really, really similar. Uh, the tuition is about $900 difference, uh, and so, but that's about it, right? The socioeconomic made up is about the same. How long it takes to graduate, uh, uh, the ethnic makeup of, of the population is about the same. When you start getting into the nitty gritty of the details, uh, you actually start to see some significant differences. So for low income students that Scholar Match serves, actually the difference in the tuition is $3,500, not $900. Uh, and then also looking at graduation rates, the, the, the graduation rates it takes longer at San Jose State to graduate than it does at San Francisco State. So in this case, when you actually do the math, it ends up costing you $21,000 more. And so this is why you get the data out there, because these folks are targeting the people in the Bay Area who are low-income students, and this makes a huge difference to them. So this is, again, ed.gov can't do this, but these folks can. One other quick example is College Apicus. They actually created a, uh, a, a Pell Abacus, a version of this for folks who, are, who receive free lunch. And again, really similar uh, experience, uh, which is uh, Middlebury College, if you are uh, of means, costs $63,000 a year. Miami-Dade College costs $11,000. If you are a low-income student, it is actually cheaper for you to go to Middlebury, School, Middlebury College than it is to go to Miami-Dade or University of Central Florida. And so being able to get that into the hands of people who actually can use it uh, is really, really critical. I also just want to say also about open data. Literally when uh, uh, the College Abacus folks presented to us, they, they thanked us for opening up the data and making it 
uh, public and accessible to them. Their quote is, we are inspired by Ed's bravery and commitment. It made a huge, huge difference to be able to say, look, this data is free and accessible and give it to you in ways that are palatable and consumable and you can use it. Uh, and they have, they showed up. They did, by the way, those two people, those two projects happened in under four weeks in August of last year. Over summer break, they were like, sure, okay, we will just do it. So opening it up, people, it is amazing what you can do with the power of the community. So to wrap up, um, the two things that I just want you guys to take away from here is uh, user-centered design is critical, whether it's user-centered design for tech, for policy, for government, for education. Um, and you want to actually build for the user always. And it's not just kind of what you think the user thinks, but get out to the building, get out of the building and talk to them and empathize. So it's not, what's the answer to this? It's actually understanding their problems and their particular, where you stand behind them, you watch them do the thing that they were gonna do anyway. It's not about bringing your ideas to it, it's actually about listening and understanding what's critical to them. And again, opening up the data um, and using the strength and the creativity of the community in order to actually change the market. So these two techniques, I will say, no matter what it is that you're doing, save time, save money, and at the end of the day, they deliver way, way, way better results. And that's it. Thank you.